Okay, uh, I'm picking up here on the second half of this uh, of this discussion of the international capital asset pricing model. Basically, went through the uh, the idea that uh, ICAPM is the traditional capital asset pricing model, or or really the um, the use of the security market line that incorporates currency effects, and it shows how they're two different effects. So if we wanted to build the ICAP M equation from what we talked about in part one, it's really fairly straightforward. Um, we will add the risk-free rate uh, simply because all uh, risky investments should on average beat the risk-free rate or else there's no point in investing in them. Um, plus a premium for uh, taking on market risk uh, and there, therefore you measure that with beta, which includes both the correlation with the world market and sort of the relative volatility. So for example, something that's perfectly correlated with the world market, um, but in fact is uh, much more volatile, will actually have a higher beta than, um, than one, whereas something that is just as volatile as the world market but isn't correlated may have a very low beta. So you have a, a premium for the world market return, then a number, a lot, a bunch of gammas times um, time spot rate risk premiums that, uh, that basically account for the fact that as currency rates change, this business will become more or less profitable and that will show up in the returns. And then finally, um, a risk premium for, to incorporate the fact uh, if you are exposed to another currency, uh, if, your, if your security or your investment is listed in another currency, then you have direct exposure um, from, from the changes in that currency. So you sort of add all of those different parts at the end, and I find it sort of easy to remember that way. Um, otherwise, I'll show you a different thing that, that comes up. Um, it can be very confusing um, when people tell you to add one to a gamma. Um, if the security is in your own currency, so let's say uh, we're a U.S. investor and we're investing in Apple, uh, you basically can ignore the the <coughs> security risk premium for direct exposure because your currency cannot change unexpectedly re related to itself. A dollar is always worth a dollar. Um, so the security risk premium is always zero if you're invested in your own currency. So I'm a U.S. investor. I'm invested in Apple. I have no... Uh, I don't need that last term because uh, my returns are all in um, in dollars. However, these other gammas uh, in the equation are still important because Apple imports a lot of stuff, um, a lot of parts from Asia. Um, a lot of assembly is done in um, in parts of Asia, so it's exposure to the, those currencies. If the if the dollar strengthens relative to those currencies, the imports. Um, the cost of those imports go down. On the other hand, if the dollar weakens, then it also has a global market for, say, things like iPhones and 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 computers. Uh, if the dollar um, strengthens, then the exports will go down. Or if the dollar weakens, those exports should become more attractive. So those things will remain no matter whether you're invested in a foreign uh, security or a, um, a domestic one. But if you are invested in the same country, then you do not have this security risk premium. Now we'll talk about this part that sometimes comes up where they say, well, um, if you're invested in a foreign um, asset, you have to add one to gamma. But basically, let's suppose that we're investing in, in Petrobras, and let's suppose that the, the security or the um, spot risk premium number one is the uh, strength of the is the strength of the real versus the dollar. If we assume that, then basically because we're listed, uh, invested in something that's listed in, in reais, where we have direct exposure, that's the, that's the one times the SRP. And then of course the company uh, is also uh, affected by the strength of its own currency as well. And so there's a, there's a gamma to that currency. And so if you use the distributive property to combine those terms, that's where the one plus gamma comes from. So uh, that's, that's, that I think sort of clears that up. What, what they can do on the exam if, they're, if they want to be really nasty to you is they can um, give you a gamma that's neg something like negative 0.5 and then you know, try to sneak, uh, be sneaky about um, having you add one. So just keep your, you know, do a problem or two once this gets clear to you and it should be better. Um, I, so, so just to kind of sum up this part, um, I find that it's easy to build up that 
international capital asset pricing model if you think about it in terms of building up the time value of money plus a premium for market risk um, plus a bunch of gammas that reflect the effects on business profitability and then decide um, what um, what currency the actual security is listed in and decide if you need to add um, the effect from holding an asset listed in a different currency and that basically is it however before um, before I want to uh, finish up here. I want to talk about uh, a, a couple of other aspects of market integration, purchasing power parity, and real exchange rates. These often get sort of mixed into the discussion, and they're relevant. Um, I just want to tell you why they're relevant. Um, it, and uh, basically, the idea that markets are fully integrated that basically means that goods can goods and finances can flow around the world unimpeded and find the best uh, the best price everywhere. There are no sort of exchange controls or anything like that. Um, and if that's true, then there will be only one real risk-free rate, and it will be the same for all investors. Now, nominal risk-free rates that uh, may vary from country to country, but they should the differences in those should only reflect changes in sort of the the expansion of the money supply or inflation. Um, if there isn't, uh, if markets are not fully integrated, then each country has its own real risk-free rate, and you should, in these equations, use the real risk-free rate for your own country. In fact, what happens is you probably should use the real risk-free rate um, for your home country in any case, because um, it's either the same as the rest of the world, um, or uh, unless you're actually in an unstable country that maybe doesn't um, an emerging market country, for example, but you, uh, basically you you either have the same risk-free rate for the entire world, or uh, if each country has its own real risk-free rate because markets aren't integrated, then you'll use your own anyway. So you know, in general, just use your own risk-free rate uh, or the risk-free rate of the domestic investor or wherever the investor is located. Um, purchasing power parity. What does that really mean? Basically. It means if you took a basket of stuff, say a computer, an automobile, uh, a month's supply of groceries, um, a month's rent, and somehow you sold it, I guess you can't sell rent, but um, and you sold this basket of stuff for cash, and then you um, and then you converted that cash into um, another currency, and in that country you went and bought the exact same group of things. Um, the idea is that you wouldn't have any gain or loss other than the transaction cost. That's basically what purchasing power parity means. Um, and if it holds, then basically there's no need to account for the currency effects in ICAPM because um, what one of the conclusions of that is that um, real exchange rates can't change uh, if purchasing power parity holds all the time. And as a result, there actually will be no um, uh, spot rate risk premium. They will basically, uh, basically forward rates will perfectly predict um, exchange rate changes if purchasing power parity holds. Um, there's also a discussion of real exchange rates. Real exchange rates are challenging um, because they can't be observed. Um, so I want to tell you what real exchange rates are. Basically, you know, to contrast them, the nominal exchange rate tells you how many of currency X, say dollars, will it take to buy a unit of currency Y, say euros. Um, those are highly visible. They're sort of, they're they're um, quoted sort of twenty four seven actually in the case of. Uh, in, ca in the case of currency markets, and if you wanted to talk about how a real exchange rate is different, they basically tell you how much of, a, of, of economy X is stuff, and, and you might measure it by sort of what can an hour of labor in this economy purchase. How much is needed to acquire a unit of economy Y's stuff? So um, basically, it, it tells you how hard it tells you more or less how hard it is to acquire stuff in one economy versus another, and what it can be exchanged for. Um, if real exchange rates don't change over time, then basically what that means is that you don't need any um, any of this currency modification either. Um, the the spot rate risk premiums. Um, basically are always zero. And the reason why we talk about ex real exchange rates is that it's a less restrictive condition than requiring PPP. So purchasing power parity or the uh, or simply constant real exchange rates uh, are all that you need to say that you don't need to um, do any currency modifications. You can just use the traditional CAPM, which is called kind of extended CAPM when applied to the world, but it's really just the same formula. So uh, I think I've summed this up. I hope it's become clearer for you um, the 